Okay, um, so uh, we're about to begin um, uh, PG Vilo, in, in other terms, um, defense of uh, Ivan Knusov. Uh, my name is uh, Vasily Ferutov. Um, I'm a professor at the Center for Photonic Science and uh, Engineering, and uh, I will be chairing uh, today's defense. Um, before we start, allow me to briefly introduce um, each jury member, uh, the supervisory team of the candidate and the candidate uh, himself. So, um, as, um, as an external uh, examiners, we are honored to have here Dr. Uh, Dario Ballarini and Professor Fabrice Lossi. Uh, so, um, Dr. Dario Ballarini currently holds a permanent position uh, of a senior researcher at the Institute of Nanotechnology, CNR Nanotech of the National Research Council in Italy. Uh, Dr. Ballarini uh, obtained PhD in physics in 2008 from the Autonomous University of Madrid for his study of the collective behavior of quantum fluids uh, of exciton polaritons. Um, his subsequent uh, research activity carried out at International uh, Italian Institute of uh, Technology uh, um, was directed towards the experimental investigation of electro-optical properties of polariton condensates and their realization um, uh, with hybrid semiconductors for room temperature devices. Uh, Dr. Ballarini has published more than 70 research papers on the light field interactions and his uh, recent research focuses on the bound states uh, in the continuum and the turbulent flow uh, in polariton quantum fluids. Now, uh, Professor Fabrice Lossi uh, is the Chair of Light Matter Interactions and the Director of uh, Physics Studies at the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom. Uh, he has uh, held uh, this uh, position since January 2017. Uh, in his early days, uh, Fabrice uh, was a uh, uh, RYC uh, researcher at the, condensate, uh, at the condensed matter theory division of the Autonomous University of Madrid, where he led the quantum polaritonics group. Uh, he also served as the theory principal investigator for the EU funded ERC uh, Polar Flow project, which was based in uh, Lecce, Italy. Now, before joining the University of Wolverhampton, Professor Lassier had worked in Sheffield and Southampton and in, in the UK and also a number of countries, including Spain uh, and Germany, as Marie Curie Fellow. Additionally, Professor Lucy uh, was the scientist in charge of the Squirrel Project. Um, among internal jury members, we have uh, today uh, Dr. Nina Voronova, um, who is uh, an associate professor uh, at the National Research uh, Nuclear University, uh, MIFI. She currently works uh, in the university's uh, Department of Theoretical Physics and conducts research in quantum physics and condensed matter physics. Uh, and Nina Voronova graduated Moscow uh, Engineering Physics Institute and obtained PhD degree in 2012 from the Institute of Spectroscopy of Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, besides the research, uh, Professor Voronova is an instructor at MIFI's uh, at MIFI teaching quantum physics, introduction uh, to theoretical physics and quantum mechanics. Um, the next uh, jury member present uh, today, uh, physically present today from Skoltek is uh, Dr. Dr. Yuri Gladush, who is an uh, assistant professor in the laboratory of nanomaterials at Skoltek where he is responsible for developing optical applications, um, optical applications uh, uh, of carbon nanotubes and other nanomaterials, including ultra short pulse generation and fiber lasers and uh, carbon nanotube based uh, bolometers. Uh, prior to joining Skoltek, Yuri Gladush worked at the Institute of Spectroscopy of Russian Academy of Sciences, where he conducted research on uh, resonance energy transfer in organic and inorganic semiconductor hybrid structures. He obtained a PhD degree from the same institution uh, for his uh, theoretical research into nonlinear wave phenomena in Bose-Einstein condensates and optics. 
Um, and uh, well, we're almost done uh, with, uh, uh, with jury members. Let me just say a few words about um, yours truly. So as I mentioned, uh, um, I'm currently hold, I currently hold the post of a full professor in the Center of Photonic Science and Engineering at Skoltech. Uh, prior to joining Skoltech, I uh, held the post of uh, a principal research fellow at uh, Southampton's Optoelectronics uh, Research Center. Um, I graduated from the Department of Physics of Lomonosov Moscow State University, and then uh, received a PhD degree in laser physics from the University of Southampton in the UK in 2003. Uh, my current research interest lies in the fields of MET materials, plasmonics, nanophotonics, and uh, toroidal electrodynamics. I sit on the steering committee of annual MET material congress, and since uh, 2011, I've also sat on program and steering committees of a number of large international conferences, such as CRIO Europe and uh, META. So uh, now onto the supervisory team. Uh, so Ivan's main supervisor was uh, Professor Pavlos uh, Logidakis, uh, and um, he's also a professor at the University of Southampton, uh, and he leads, uh, he heads bo uh, in both institutions the hybrid photonics laboratories. Uh, his research interests uh, span the fields of photonics, strong light matter interaction, uh, and coupling semiconductors, and condensed matter physics. His work in hybrid photonics includes the first demonstration of hybrid um, LED and photovoltaic devices utilizing resonance energy transfer, first room temperature polyton transistor, and a single photon switch. His contributions to the field of uh, polytonics and hybrid photonics were honored uh, in, two uh, in 2011 with an award on quantum electronics from the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. physics. His research has been supported by non grants from the UK's uh, Engineering and Physical uh, Sciences Research Councils, four grants from the European Union and other bodies such as Royal Society, British Council, Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science, and, uh, and the Russian Foundation for Basic Research. Um, as a co-supervisor, uh, Ivan uh, had Dr. Sergei Alyatkin, um, who is um, an assistant professor at Skoltech and currently works uh, on exciton periton condensate lattices in, organ in, in, in organic mic microcavities in hybrid photonics lab. Uh, Sergey received his PhD degree from the Molecular Spectroscopy Department in the Institute of Spectroscopy of Russian Academy of Sciences, where his uh, research was focused on the uh, investigation of the up conversion mechanism in nanoparticles and uh, uh, its application for advanced nanocomplexes. Right, so um, we're almost done. Uh, now uh, the hero of the day, uh, Ivan Knusov. Uh, Ivan received his uh, both uh, bachelor degree in 2017 and master degree in 2019 from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. He also obtained master degree at Skoltech in 2019 where he worked uh, under the supervision of Professor uh, Logidakis. Uh, in the course of uh, his master and PhD studies in hybrid photonics lab at Skoltech, uh, Ivan has been studying uh, the spin properties of uh, polyton condensates and rotation-induced uh, elasticity uh, in such systems. So um, this pretty much concludes the introductory part of uh, today's event. Uh, and I'm now passing the torch uh, to Ivan, asking him to give us um, a presentation about his uh, PhD research. Just to remind, uh, the presentation should not last more than 40 minutes, and uh, no question will be uh, no questions will be taken during the uh, during the talk. So, if you happen to have uh, any questions, you will have a chance to ask them after the presentation. So, over to you, Ivan. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, indeed, my name is Ivan Gnusov, and I'm a PhD student in Skoltech. So during, today I'd like to tell you about my research project, uh, which was called Spin Artistic Control and Polariton Condensate. And it was done at Hybrid Tonic Lab at Skoltech, and my supervisor is Paul Lagudakis, my co-supervisor is Sergei Lyatkin. This was so the subject of my talk is polaritons, and first I'd like to introduce what polariton is. So polaritons, uh, they're quasi-particles, uh, 
sorry. Doesn't, right. so it worked. Uh, Polaritons uh, are the quasi-particles which arise in a strong cumbic regime between the photon and the exciton in semiconductor microcavity. So if some media which can host the exciton is put in between two closely spaced DBR uh, mirrors, uh, then if the interaction rate between the photon and exciton in this structure exceeds the decay rate of photon and exciton, then the system is no longer described in terms of two bare exciton and photon modes, but instead two, two new quasi-particles are formed which are upper and lower polariton branches. Uh, so polaritons are uh, part light, part matter, and this is why they inherit uh, the properties from both of their constituents. For example, from the photonic part, they inherit the high mobility and low effective mass, uh, which is uh, 10 to the minus pi of that of the exciton. From the excitonic part, as they inherit the possibility to interact through the Coulomb interaction. Also, polaritons are bosons, so under certain conditions, then they can occupy single energy momentum state forming the polariton condensate. Uh, the first observation of the condensate was made in 2006, and it was observed by the nonlinear increase of emission intensity of the condensate and the narrowing in both uh, energy and uh, momentum spaces. Also, polaritons are quite easy to characterize because the outcoming photon from the cavity carries all the information about the polariton, the part of which it was. So by characterizing the emission from the cavity, one can characterize the energy, momentum, and phase of polariton condensate. Uh, another important property of polaritons, it is their spin. Uh, the spin can be detectable as a polarization of, of the outcoming light and tracked on the, as a vector on the Planck RS sphere. Uh, due to their dual nature, polaritons inherit a lot of interesting spin properties, which has been already uh, proposed to use in different applications. So there are numerous theoretical and experimental proposals to use polariton condensate for the spinotronic devices. So spinotronics aims to uh, utilize the uh, spin of the particles and control them with light in order to increase the operation speed of the future devices and their uh, efficiency and uh, properties. So for example, here on the slide, you can see the proposal for the, uh, for the polariton beam splitter. And the scientists were able to, uh, to separate the flows of uh, spin up and spin down polariton space uh, in this experiment. Another uh, prominent application of polariton condensate is analog simulations. Uh, so analog simulators aim to emulate some physical system or or task which cannot be solved uh, with a conventional computer and effectively find the solution on it uh, on, the, on the physical system. So the spin could be additional on degree of freedom of such devices. In this regard, the spin uh, studies are of a great importance. However, uh, the future applications will possibly rely on the non-resonant excitation and optical trapping. And as it my thesis, so my thesis was concerning the optical trap technique, which was developed in 2014. And for this, uh, the non-resonant laser beam, which is detuned far above the lower polariton branch, uh, is uh, shaped in the form of a ring, which is shown here. And this ring excites excitons, which acts as a complex valued potential for polaritons, which is proportional to the laser intensity. So the real part of this potential, omega R, it acts as a repulsive potential and make polariton scatter from this uh, exciton reservoir. The imaginary part acts as a pump, so it receives the condensate with polaritons as a result the polaritons are formed inside of the optical trap here and uh, they can occupy only restricted set of levels energy levels which are reminiscent on that of the uh, usual uh, eigenstates of harmonic oscillator potential uh, and due to spatial separation which is achieved in this experiment with the ex of the external reserv reservoir and condensate the, in, uh, the, in the interaction of the reservoir and condensate are decreased and that is why it leads to the dramatic increase of the condensate coherence, which is now on the order of nanosecond, and increase of the spin coherence, which is very high compared to picosecond polariton lifetime. Uh, so in this regard, uh, the objective of my thesis were to investigate the spin of polariton condensate and optical trap under different excitation conditions, such as pump power polarization and trap size, and also realize control of linear polarization of such condensate study the spin of coupled condensate, realize the technique for the fast rotation of the spin, and also investigate the spin, uh, the, uh, the vorticity of the polarity condensate in, in the rotating traps. Uh, yeah, and for this, I use uh, a lot of experimental methods, which are listed here, uh, but uh, main of them are a different kind of imaging, spectroscopy, polarimetry, and uh, phase measurement. 
So, yeah. And I would like to start. Uh, yeah. And Tejas is uh, structured as follows. So it has eight chapters. And first three of them are introductory one, which concerns the physics and experimental methods used, uh, used uh, during my research. And uh, the other four chapters uh, uh, concern the research, which done here uh, in the scope of the thesis. So first two of them uh, concern the polariton properties, spin properties in the static optical trap, either ring or elliptical one. And the other two concern the rotating potential and uh, uh, rotating of the optical trap and the studying of the spin properties and vorticity and such rotating potential. I would like to start with the first chapter, uh, yeah, which is actually, so this study was published in these several papers during my PhD talk, uh, during my PhD study, and uh, the thesis concerns the four of them, which I listed here. And so now I would like to start with my first chapter, which is spin of polarity and condensate in the optical trap. Uh, so the main properties of the spin, so the hallmarks of the spin of the polaritons in the resonant excitation are listed here. So since a condensate uh, can be described by one wave function, it is also described at one spin value or spinner value. And it appears that under resonant excitation, the properties of the spin are strongly dependent on the uh, polarization of the resonant excitation. So for example, for the case of circle, circle, uh, circular polarized excitation, uh, the pump forms uh, uh, the excitons, uh, which are also polarized, polar, uh, polarized uh, same as a, as a pump laser. So if you uh, if your pump is tricircle polarization, the exciton also will have spin one, and then uh, some population of these uh, spins are transferred to the condensate, and if it doesn't decay fully, then the polarization is uh, from the from the non resonant excitation is transferred to the condensate as well, and this process is called optical orientation. However, situation is different uh, when we pump with linearly polarized excitation. In this case, the equal number of uh, spin up and spin up spin down polaritons are born, uh, which is given the equal rate of the scattering of uh, polariton different spin uh, to the condensate also result in the equal population of the spin up and spin, up, uh, spin down polaritons in the condensate. In this regard, uh, due to the symmetry break and condensate can adopt uh, in general any linear polarization and from realization realization of the condensate, you will see a different linear polarization state coming from the condensate. However, if the system is somehow anisotropic, for example, due to birefringence or strains in the system, then condensate will adopt some defined linear polarization state and always will form in this state. And this uh, effect is called polarization pinning. So to study the properties of the condensate, we use such type of excitation setup, uh, experimental setup. Uh, so we use the non-resonant excitation laser, uh, which was chopped with, uh, chopped with acoustic optical modulator in order to form two microsecond pulses uh, to not to hit the sample. Then uh, the, the laser beam was shaped with a spatial light modulator in any form, basically, but here we shaped in form of a ring. And then this ring, uh, ring shape pattern is focused on the sample, which is gas in gas micro cavity hold at uh, for Kelvin Kreistat. And then we study the photoluminescence of the sample of polaritons in both real and reciprocal space. Also, we study the dispersion of the condensate with a spectrometer and study all of the polarization component with a full stock polarimeter, which is shown here. And uh, our system was so the uh, polariton system looks as follows. So we, we pump uh, with such an excitation. So it is a ring with a 12 micron diameter. The condensate is formed inside of the trap, as I was shown, uh, telling you previously. The condensate distribution is shown here. And uh, the condensate is in trap occupies the lowest energy state, so the ground state of the optical trap, which is shown here below the threshold, uh, above the threshold for the dispersion. Uh, yeah, and we study the condensate only in the ground state for this study. And we start uh, by the measurement of polarization uh, of the condensate at this 12 micron trap, and we characterized first uh, the overall degree of polarization of the condensate, depending on both pump power, which is here on x axis and uh, pump polarization, which is here controlled with quarter wave plate and station pass goes from uh, the right circular here uh, to left circular on the right uh, through linear polarization state. So this polarization map uh, depicts the degree of linear polarization uh, for sweeping these parameters. And what we can see uh, that below the threshold, uh, which is marked here with a dashed line, the condensate is almost unpolarized. The degree of polarization is close to zero. However, when the condensation occurs, 
then it adopts some defined polarization state, which is characterized by the almost unity value of degree of polarization. Uh, however, it holds for the for every polarization of the excitation study, except for the one case of this peculiar region here, where for the linear polarization of excitation, condensate first seems to be unpolarized above the threshold, however, then it adopts some defined polarization state. Uh, to understand what happens here, we also investigate the degree of linear polarization of the condensate and its a three so circle polarization component. And we see here that for this linear polarization of the excitation, the condensate eventually adopts some linear polarization state, which is prominent here in the growth of degree of linear polarization. Uh, and it is this effect of polarization pinning, which I was describing you previously. On the other hand, for the case of circle polarization, the condensate adopts the same polarization uh, from the pump. So for example, here uh, I pump with a sigma minus polarization and the condensate also adopts negative S3 component, which means that it is also, uh, it has polarization sigma minus, so it's left circularly polarized. And uh, to investigate this peculiar region of the zero degree of polarization, we perform the study of the condensate for different trap sizes, which is, will be next on the next slide. And we study three sizes of the optical trap. So it is uh, 15, 12, and nine micron in diameter just shown here on the slide. And we uh, detect uh, the degree of linear polarization of the condensate created in such a trap. And we see that this linear polarization island, so appearance of linear polarization is observed only for the bigger trap. However, it is absolutely absent for the case of the, the smallest trap. And from this, we can conclude that this effect is somehow connected uh, with the shape of the optical trap. In more details, uh, the smaller the trap, the bigger the overlap between the exciton reservoir, which is incoherent, and the condensate. And this reservoir, it destabilizes spin, making it uh, stochastically flip on the equator of Planck sphere. And it was actually supported by the simulation made by Dr. Helge Sigurdsson. And he showed by modeling the gross equation that indeed, uh, for the smaller trap, where the interaction between the condensate reservoir are big, the condensate is flipping between uh, spin being vertically elongated and horizontally elongated within the excitation, the excitation pulse, uh, pulse once on a second scaling here. However, eventually, if the uh, trap is bigger or the pump power is more, then spin stabilizes and stays in the polarization stand, state where, uh, which is defined by the polarization pinning. And here it is this triangle on the figure B. However, there is another interesting region where the degree of linear polarization is close to zero for the case of elliptical, elliptical polarized excitation, which is marked with a circle. And for this simulation shows that in this case, uh, polarity starts to precess around uh, the, uh, the pole of Planck sphere in the process called self-induced long precession. So then, uh, then equal population of the spin-up and spin under elliptical excitation results into the splitting of such levels which effectively can be described as the effective magnetic field, uh, which is pointed out of plane of the cavity. Uh, and as a result, spin precise around the field, as would uh, usual spin do. And it, actually, it effectively lowers the measured degree of linear polarization in our integrated measurement. Uh, interestingly, uh, later on, uh, these findings was supported by experimental findings made by Stepan Barish which is present here. And he showed that indeed, for the case of linearly polarized excitation, there are spin flips, uh, which are measurable as uh, the uh, anti-bunching observed in the cross-correlation function of the horizontal and vertical intensities. And he observes the bunching, which, which means that on the time scale of nanosecond, spin is indeed flipping between different linearly polarized states, uh, resulting in lowering of average DAP in the previous measurement. He also showed that under elliptically polarized excitation, the condensate processes, which is evident here uh, as the uh, oscillations measured again in this cross correlation intensity function. Uh, so it's shown here. Uh, so, but so far, uh, the linear polarization of the condensate was strongly dependent on the place on the sample. And basically, if you move from, from point one to point two on the sample, we retrieve different polarization, which will be defined by the local birefringence. So for example, here we retrieve the vertical polarization, which is evident for the low S2 component. And here we retrieve some diagonal polarization. But for the future application, it is crucial to obtain the control over all polarization state, uh, which will be done in the, uh, in the next chapter, uh, yeah, which is concerned the optical linear polarization 
engineering can single and couple polarity and condensate. So to achieve uh, the control of the linear polarization state, we use such type of optical excitation, which is shown here. So it is a more or less a ring, but it has non-uniform intensity around the circumference here. And his, it has a big, bigger intensity on the upper and lower part of it. And this unequivalent intensity is leads to the effective elliptical shape of the confining potential, which in turn results to the elliptical shape of polarity condensate, which is shown here in the real space and in the reciprocal space. And uh, so having this in mind, we first start uh, with the ring excitation, which is symmetric, and we identify the region of the sample on the sample where we have low polarization pinning. So we scan our sample and excite in different points and uh, find where the all polarization components are close to zero, which is shown here on figure A. However, when we now shape our excitation pin to the elliptical one, which was presented previously uh, here, and uh, we see that for the vertically elongated condensate, we see the formation of this uh, S1 component, which increase uh, reaching approximately 0 0.8, which means that condensate now is horizontally polarized. Now, when we rotate our excitation pattern to be horizontally elongated, we see that S1 component going down, meaning that polarization of the condensate is not vertical. So indeed, uh, the polarization now follows the short axis of the optical trap or the condensate, and we achieved uh, the control of the linear polarization. If we now continuously, so we change the pump uh, power uh, pump uh, shape to go through all orientations and uh, detect uh, the stocks component, we see that they go through a sign curve, so they have a sign shape uh, as one as two component, which uh, means that the polarization state of the condensate sweep uh, the all linear polarization state on the Poincaré sphere, which is shown here uh, on the sphere. And uh, meaning that uh, we indeed achieved the control of linear polarization state. And we describe it uh, by the both uh, elliptical shape of the condensate, which splits uh, uh, the energy levels and the inherent TATM splitting present in the microcavity, which make condensate to adopt one of these linear polarization state. We actually measure the splitting between linearly polarized states in the condensate to be approximately 20 microelectron volts. And you can see this, uh, as uh, it is some effective in plane magnetic field now uh, formed uh, with this elliptical optical trap, which may condensate a, a line along it. And that is why we see the defined polarization state. Uh, so this uh, effective magnetic field is depends both on the trap size, which is here is a delta omega, and the strength of the TTM splitting. And uh, further, we wanted to study the diet of the coupled condensate, which is a building block of the future extended polariton system. So we bring two, cond two elliptical condensate close together, close together here, and we see that they are coupled uh, from the fringes in the real space. So they talk to each other. And, uh, but when we measure the polarization of, of this condensate, we measure interesting thing that uh, the, even though the polarization of both condensate is similar, it is not stable from realization to realization. So here, it is different microsecond realizations of the condensate split in vertical and horizontal polarization domain. And we can see that both of the condensate flip from vertical to horizontal and vice versa. And if we now plot the real distribution of the S1 and S2 component, S1 component, we see that for some cases, for some realizations, the condensate is horizontally polarized, which is shown here on figure A. And for some cases, it is vertically polarized, both of them, which is shown here on the figure B. That it depends that uh, this uh, polarization coupling of the condensate is, it depends on the separation distance of the condensate. And uh, as for the 27.5 microns uh, distance between the condensate, which was shown here, the both condensate flipping uh, from the vertical to horizontal polarization from one shot to another. Uh, however, if we now uh, shrink the separation between the condensate uh, to be now 26.5 micron, we see that uh, both polarization have now uh, S1 component close to zero, which means that there is some complex evolution of the spin within one excitation pulse, which uh, results into averaging of the S1 component to zero. And uh, the simulations performed again by Dr. Helge Sigurdsson showed that indeed this effect is uh, distance dependent and it is connected uh, through the time delayed coupling of the uh, polaritons, uh, because uh, uh, depending on the separation distance, 
the condensate can couple in one energy state or it is some transition region uh, where they can occupy two energy states. For example, it is out of phase or in phase for the usual coupling. And here it is the same. So for the case uh, when they are coupled uh, so efficiently with one energy state, uh, we see one defined polarization state, which indeed flips from one shot to shot, but it is stable from within one shot, within one excitation shot. However, when we increase the distance, uh, then there are two energy levels in the system presence making the condensate spin to stochastically flip between uh, different polarization state within the shot, which effectively averages out to the zero degree of polarization. But uh, there is still a lot to investigate here. Uh, it, uh, Helge also showed that uh, the coupling depends on the pump power, on the mutual orientation of the condensate. So there are a lot of work to be done in here. But overall, uh, I have achieved the control of uh, linear polarization state in the condensate and also studied uh, the coupling between two elliptical condensate. However, uh, in this measurement, the limiting factor for the speed of the rot rotation of the uh, polarization was the spatial light modulator, which response frequency was around 100 Gertz. But we wanted to increase the control of this rotation. And for this, we developed a special method for the optical trap rotation, which will be uh, described in the uh, next chapter. So the next chapter is concerned the spin of the condensate in the rotating potential and optically driven spin precession. So to do the rotation of the optical trap, we use optical methods. Uh, so we use now two excitation lasers, which are shown here, uh, F1 and F2. And we shape each of them separately with two spatial light modulator in the form of a ring. Uh, you can see it here. And also we imprint some phase winding on each of these beams with a spatial light modulator. And uh, orbital angular of, of one beam, it is one. Of the other, it is minus one. And now if you make uh, the intensity of two lasers not equal, so the one is less, uh, has less intensity than the other, then we see uh, that uh, the, sh the shape which appears when we uh, sum up two beams on the beam splitter. So the beating of this signal results into the rotation of the beating pattern in time. And uh, the rotation frequency is dictated by both uh, frequency difference of the excitation lasers and the difference of the angle momentum. And also please notice uh, that this excitation pattern is very much similar to that of we used in the previous experiment, which is shown here on the app uh, for the linear polarization control. So now when we apply this rotating excitation to the condensate, uh, we see uh, that and split the polarization, uh, split uh, the condensate emission into polarization domain with a polarizing beam splitter to detect separately horizontal and vertical polarization components in time. We see that these polarization components indeed oscillate in time, which is shown on the slide as H and V. And uh, they have a signed shape and uh, Moreover, they are out of phase. So when it is the maximum of the horizontal polarization component, then it is minimum of the vertical one. It, is, it means that indeed the spin is rotating in time, which result in this uh, intensity modulation of the polarization component. When we now additionally measure the diagonal polarization component and calculate the S1 and S2 stocks components, uh, we see uh, that spin of the condensate again sweep the circle on the equatorial plane on the of the Poincaré sphere, and it goes through all linear polarization state, but now as a frequency of five megahertz. So the rotation frequency was five megahertz. Uh, yeah, we wanted to increase the rotation speed even more, and now we set the rotation frequency to 0 0.5 gigahertz. So it is already in gigahertz range. But the previous apparatus for the measurement will not work in this case, and we switch to another one. Uh, which is uh, the time correlation of the intensity. So we use, we again split uh, the emission from the condensate on the horizontal and vertical projections. And now we measure the, the coincidence intensity of two of these two beams with the HBT interferometer and time, time correlated signal photo counting. But amazingly now uh, for the linear polarization of the excitation, we do not see any rotation in the condensate, but we see the dynamics, which is very similar to that of was this for the static trap. So previously for the static trap, we saw that uh, cross correlation G2 function had a dip in a zero time delay, uh, uh, which 
corresponds to the flipping of the spin in time. And here it is, it is the same. So even the trap it rotates, spin doesn't adopt the rotation and we see uh, that it is uh, the characteristic of the static trap. But now the situation is different when we apply some polarization elliptic to the excitation laser. So we do it by inserting the quarter wave plate in the excitation pass. And eventually at some quarter wave plate angle, we see that spin adopts uh, the rotation and start to rotate on a par with the optical trap, which is shown here uh, with a yellow curve of the two correlation function, cross correlation function. Uh, so uh, it oscillates in time with a frequency here of one gigahertz, which is the, the rotation of the optical trap. And indeed we are able to rotate the spin at one gigahertz. However, when we now plot uh, the total of the correlation function or the two coherence of the whole condensate emission, so we just remove the PBS, we see that it is almost flat and equals to one everywhere, which means that the condensate is coherent and there is no any intensity oscillation, but what oscillate is the spin of the condensate. Uh, furthermore, we study the dependence of the appearance of this precession of the pump polarization elliptic here, and we scan as a pump polarization elliptic, so we rotate the quarter wave plate and uh, study the G2 cross correlation function, uh, depending on the different pump polarization elliptic. And we see, uh, so it's presented here on this map. And we see that the, uh, the precession is adopted only for the certain value of uh, pump polarization elliptic, which is here is around eight degree. However, for the other cases, the spin doesn't rotate. And when we plot now the range of this function uh, at a bigger time delay, so here on the inset, uh, we see that it is indeed a resonance right, which appears around eight degree of the pump polarization elliptic. Uh, when we now increase the rotation speed to be one gigahertz, we see that the resonance is eventually uh, it is shifted uh, to the bigger polarization elliptic, and now it is appeared around uh, 13 uh, degrees of uh, pump polarization elliptic. And from this, we can conclude that it is somehow dependent on the elliptic, and uh, pump polarization elliptic, as I was telling you previously, it results into the Laron precession of the polarity and condensate. And it appears that when and only when uh, the, this internal precession frequency is equal to the external rotation, which we induce with the laser, then the condensate adopts uh, the external steering and starts to precess uh, in step with the rotation trap. So it is a driven precession, which features uh, the pro prominent resonance uh, with the internal frequency of the condensate spin precessions. It is, it was also confirmed by the simulations uh, made by Helge Sigurdsson. So the simulation got the task equation. He also demonstrated that indeed there is a resonance which appears only uh, at some value of pump polarization elliptic. Furthermore, uh, we investigate the time stability of this precession and measure the cross correlation function now at a bigger time delays. So we increase our delays to 200 nanosecond and we see uh, that precession is indeed present even at a big uh, at that big uh, time delays. You can compare it with the self-induced long precession, which is shown here in red, and the black one. It is the driven precession induced by the optical trap. You can see that spin coherence is dramatically increased, uh, which one would expect it because this uh, precession it is driven, so it exists uh, while uh, the rotation exists. However, this. Uh, limitation of 173 nanosecond was dictated only by the mutual laser stability uh, and it uh, decreased uh, the observed coherence time. However, the precession is present for the whole two microsecond pulse uh, where we excite the condensate. Overall, this effect is reminiscent of the classical nu nuclear magnetic resonance effect where the spin is put in the strong holding magnetic field uh, here and then it starts to process and then some uh, RF pulse, magnetic pulse, or RF frequencies applied to this spin. And it starts to absorb only when the frequency of this precession, of, of its precession is equal to the uh, RF pulse frequency. And the same in our case, uh, so the holding field in our case, it is the effective magnetic field coming from the polarization electricity and the control field, it is a trap rotation, uh, which we induced by the rotating optical trap. But notice that this fitting magnetic field, we induce them uh, only by the matter of lasers, so only all optically, so without any uh, usual magnetic field. And uh, 
it is it can be useful for the applications of the advanced control of the spin uh, of polarity and condensate because for example this method of the mri is conventionally used for the control of the qubit state or some spin state for the application but now when we have this beautiful beautiful technique of the trap rotation it is logical to do the classical experiment which is rotating bracket experiment and it is uh, the topic of my next chapter and uh, yeah so just to remind if you put uh, the classical water in the rotating container or in the bucket it will adopt uh, eventually adopt the external rotation due to the viscosity and one vortex will form in the bulk of this fluid which is shown here on figure three and it starts to rotate with the container however the situation changes when we have not classical fluid but superfluid the superfluid is a rotational but it can host the rotation only in terms of quantized vortices and in this uh, regard when you put the superfluid in the rotating container you will see the increased number of vortices for the faster rotation so it was observed firstly at uh, 1979 and scientists saw one two three vortices and more appearing for the faster rotating of the reservoir the same was observed with atomic bcs where they rotate the uh, uh, was I condensate with uh, either with the laser so magnetic field is also observed in the formation of the vortex vortices and the increased number of vortices with increased rotation, rotation speed however it wasn't so far done with polariton condensate why uh, because uh, for rotate polariton condensate you will need a, a very high speed which wasn't acce uh, accessible to date however one would expect that it will work with polariton condensate because the vortices can, can uh, was shown uh, in polariton condensate and first was shown 2008 and also at certain conditions polaritons can be super fluid so the rotating back experiment can be reproduced with the polariton condensate and uh, so we did and for this we use such type of excitation setup so now we use uh, again the two lasers which we shape uh, with special light modulators but now we make the intensity equal and this result into such type of uh, rotating pattern which is shown here on the slide and uh, yeah now when we apply this laser pattern to the to the sample and set the rotation uh, frequency to be here around two gigahertz we see indeed that condensate eventually occupies the vortex state and we can see the clear evidence of vortex which is the hollow core intensity distribution in the real space and the dashed line here depicts the circumference of optical trap uh, furthermore, uh, when we measure the dispersion of condensate, we see that the condensate occupies uh, the single energy state, which is the first excited state of the optical trap. And now when we retrieve uh, the phase of the condensate by, by, by the interference measurement, we see uh, that indeed the condensate now hosts a vortex, uh, which has a topological charge of one. So it rotates, the phase of it rotates here anticlockwise, which uh, also co-directed uh, with the trap rotation because trap was also rotated here anti-clockwise but how to control the rotation direction it is uh, uh, can be clear from this uh, formula, formula on the slide and it can be controlled by the sign of this f rotation frequency or f prime and uh, so the negative rotation frequency it is a clockwise, clockwise rotation then positive it is counterclockwise so one can uh, change the frequency detuning or detuning between the angle momentum so the difference and a trap will rotate in different directions clockwise or anti-clockwise to check that uh, we fix now the orbital angular momentum of the lasers to be one and minus one respectively and for the positive rotation frequency we observe uh, the vortex forming in the condensate for the negative one we observe the anti-vortex forming in, into the condensate and now uh, when we flip uh, the optical angle momentum or, uh, of the station lasers to be minus one and one respectively uh, we see the opposite picture so now for the positive rotation frequency we see the anti-vortex forming in the condensate and for the positive one for the negative one we see vortex so indeed with external rotation we can control uh, the direction of the steering inside the condensate so uh, of uh, rotation of the vortex and the condensate but of the fundamental interest of the rotating bucket experiment that is the frequency dependence and we actually noticed uh, that the real space distribution of the condensate is strongly depends on the rotation frequency so for the slow rotation frequencies the condensate uh, is formed on top of the optical trap and inside of it and is uh, spilled out from the trap which is evident from this uh, blue white region uh, around the condensate however 
eventually at some rotation speeds of here at uh, 2.5 gigahertz, uh, we see a vortex forming inside of the condensate, meaning uh, that the condensate now occupies the first excited state of the trap and have a vortex. However, when we increase the frequency even more, uh, we now see the ground state forming inside of the condensate, uh, which can host a vortex and it, it will have just a flat phase. So the vortex disappears eventually. To, to summarize uh, this data, uh, we plot here the number of vortices observed in the condensate for 100 real shots of the condensate, 100 single shot of the condensate uh, multiplied by its topological charge. And we see indeed that the vortex appears only in some narrow range of frequency. So here from one to four gigahertz, uh, it eventually disappears. And also we can see that uh, the charge, topological charge of the vortex is flipped. So for the negative rotation frequencies, uh, we see the vortex. And for the positive, we see anti-vortex anti in the condensate. Uh, yes, uh, so the numerical simulation performed here by uh, Dr. Stella Harrison, uh, they reproduced uh, the experimental findings. So here it is the red dots, uh, average angle momentum of the condensate retrieved from the simulation of 2D uh, gross Petersky equation. And you can see the qualitative correspondence between the theory and experiment. However, what the theory allows us indeed, and it allows us to have an insight inside the condensate dynamics, especially it allows us to see the shape of the excitonic reservoir or shape of the optical trap in time. And to, we do that in the experiment and plot here the instantaneous profiles of the external reservoir at rift from the simulation. And we see that for the slow, slow rotation, the external reservoir here is not uniform. And that is why it cannot confine a condensate vortex state inside and uh, pollutants spill out from these low intensity regions. And uh, that is why we do not observe the vortex in the, slow, in the low rotation frequency. However, when we start to rotate faster, then, due to the finite lifetime of the exit on reservoir, it starts to smear out, uh, which is evident here at the higher uh, intensities on the on this uh, diagonal lower side, and it is now enough to host the vortex state, and also the bigger intensity exert a torque to the condensate, making it to adopt the external rotation and rotate uh, with the optical trap and have uh, the same topological charge as the rotation. However, when we increase rotation speed even more, uh, then uh, due to uh, the reservoir is uh, completely smears out. And here we see the uniform uh, exit on reservoir profile, which, uh, so it's clear that it doesn't exert any torque to the condensate. And that is why vortex uh, disappears at high rotation frequency. But uh, why don't uh, we see the second vortex forming in the condensate? And uh, to study that, uh, we investigate the pump power dependence of the condensate energy. So if we measure dispersion of the condensate here, then integrate it over K vectors and plot uh, the energy of the condensate as a function of pump power. So here on the slide, on the y-axis is energy, on the x-axis is uh, pump power. You can see that below the threshold of the condensate, so the polaritons, they are broadly distributed along different trap levels. Uh, and then eventually then when they condense, uh, the, line, the line width of the condensate narrows, and we see here the first excited state of the optical trap, which is the vortex state here for 1.4 gigahertz rotation frequency. Note also that eventually at some pump power, the condensate drops to the ground state, uh, which is Gaussian, and in this state, it cannot have any vortices, uh, and that's why we will lose vortices at bigger pump power. However, when we increase rotation frequency more, so here it is 3.1, Gigahertz, we see that this transition from to the ground state, it appears to be closer at the pumping power. So it appears here uh, at around 1.2 uh, power threshold, whereas here it was 1.25. And we uh, increase the rotation speed even more to 5 or to 8 gigahertz. And we see that now immediately above the threshold, the condensate is forming in the ground state of the optical trap, which is shown here. And for the faster, uh, the situation is the same. And this ground state of the optical trap, the condensate can ha cannot have a vortex. And that is why we see the vortex disappearing for the higher rotation frequency. So uh, if we would see the second vortex forming in the condensate, then it should form at the high energy state. So in the second excited one, but it can have indeed a vortex, so two vortices. 
but the dynamics of our system makes the condensate goes to low energy state, then to, to the high energy state. So, and that is why, because of the dynamics of the condensate, we do not see the second vortex in the condensate. And uh, in order to see two vortices or three vortices in the condensate, you can uh, uh, either increase the trap size, so make your traps bigger, where it will have a possibility to occupy the second excited state or uh, uh, use a different sample with different dynamics, which uh, goes not to the low energy state, but to the higher one. But overall, uh, we're able to reproduce the rotating bucket experiment and uh, just to compare uh, the superfluid, uh, the vortices appearing in the superfluid helium in the rotating bucket experiment below appearing at the millihertz frequency. Uh, for the atomic BC, the frequency was on the order of 100 of hertz. However, for the case of polariton condensate, the critical frequency of rotation it is 10 to the seventh power high. And also, we do not observe the formation of uh, the second vortex. So this study, uh, as shown here, it, it is opens a great uh, perspective for the study of polariton condensate uh, with the other superfluids and uh, with the atomic BC because it is somehow similar, but it also has a lot of different properties as shown here on the slide. Uh, it brings me to the end of my talk. And uh, the title of my talk is uh, Spinner Nautistic Control on Polariton Condensate. And uh, I think that it was achieved uh, to a good degree uh, because uh, we're able to control the spin of the condensate with pump power, with trap size, with trap shape, with elliptical trap, and also to drive the spin persistently on the optical uh, on the Poincaré sphere with the uh, with external driving and also investigated the vorticity which is induced in polariton condensate by the rotating trap and this work it wouldn't be possible uh, without these guys uh, so I would like to thank my supervisor Paulus my supervisor Sergey Helgi and Stella who did simulations uh, for my experiments and Stepan Kirill and Julian so thank you very much if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, uh, Ivan. Um, so uh, the time to grill Ivan with questions. Uh, I will first go around uh, the jury members, uh, but uh, we will also welcome questions from, uh, from the members of the audience, uh, which I come back to once we are done with the uh, juries. So, um, uh, Dario uh, Ballerini, um, let me first uh, ask you whether you are um, satisfied with the changes, corrections that Ivan made to his thesis in response to your comments? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, he, he responded to my Okay, uh, very good. And, uh huh. Um, and uh, do you happen to have uh, any questions on, uh, on on the presentation that Ivan has just given us? Uh, well, yes. Uh, first of all, let me express my uh, congratulations for the excellent quality of these results, both to the candidate and to his supervisors. Um, so I'm, I'm impressed by the technical quality of the measurements, and in particular on the level of automatization that has been achieved, that is essential to take uh, a, a huge amount of data that are needed to do this kind of statistics. Uh, so as a curiosity, so if you would say, uh, how much of the experiment can be conducted completely by remote? at this time. So when it is well aligned, uh, can the experiment be performed completely by remote? Um, uh, Dario, could you possibly repeat your question again because uh, uh, the connection was uh, breaking down? Uh, well, uh, my question is, if you had to, to say, to tell a, a percentage of how much of the measurements can be performed by remote without personal intervention in the lab? How much it is in your case? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I would say it's zero indeed uh, percent. So it, uh, 
even though the sys setup is optimized to some level, it requires the control uh, of it. So you can, of course, put a measurement, some measurement and uh, leave for like for a few minutes, for 10 minutes, uh, for 20 minutes while it goes. But then you need to go back to adjust uh, the parameters uh, which you sweep uh, in your experiment. And that is why uh, more or less the constant present of the of me or of our other experimentator is, uh, is necessary in the lab. Yeah. Yes. Um, then, then well, I have also some technical curiosity. So uh, the Mueller formalism has been used also to calibrate the polarimeter. Yeah. 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 I did the calibration uh, on the. So first it was done uh, by the excitation laser. So I just use excitation laser, and then calibrate it on the known polarization. So I put. Uh, some polarizers uh, to make linear polarization and uh, uh, yeah and uh, quarter wave plates and half wave plates to go through linear different polarization states and that's how I, I retrieve uh, the coefficients on uh, for the calculation of the stock components from the measurement of the polarimeter so so I calibrate on the normal polarization state first uh, with the laser and then uh, with the emission of the condensate but uh, because we need to calibrate also on the wavelengths in order to, to, to rule out uh, the fact of the different valence and different operation of wave plates and other polarization optic on different valence. And yeah, I put uh, the polarizer, uh, or beam splitter, polarization splitter to make the condensate polarization horizontal and vertical, so known, and then I can control it with different uh, polarization devices and characterize what uh, signals will polarimeter give me and from this again, I can correct my coefficients, which, which I use for the calculation of the stocks component, which I later will retrieve in the experiment. So yeah, it, it was the procedure. But but then all all uh, each of the optical elements on the uh, on the detection path has been calibrated independently, each one. Yeah. So or... yeah. So actually, for this. Uh, so the calibration, as for made this experiment, it was done uh, just uh, before uh, the polarimeter itself. So we put the polarization devices just in front of it. And yeah, indeed, uh, there is other optics uh, before the polarimeter in the detection pass, uh, which can change uh, the state of the polarization of the condensate uh, going through, through the system. Yeah, and uh, to correct on that, actually we did uh, the measurement of the optical retardance of the setup and of the detection part of the setup. And for this, so it is uh, described, I hope we describe better now in the details, uh, but I can tell you quickly. So basically uh, we put uh, the polarization analyzers, so uh, polarizer to the diagonal axis uh, just uh, after the sample and then characterized how this polarization coming through the setup and what, what is changes by uh, so we characterize by using just another polarizer which is the analyzer and we detect how polarization changes when it goes through the setup and uh, from this as i shown thesis it can be deduced uh, so uh, what is the optical retardance what is this delta uh, which is induced by the optical elements in the setup so it is indeed induced and as i remember it is uh, 0 0.15 pi so it's actually quite a lot quite a lot and we noticed that even one mirror, when it's not placed uh, properly at a uh, yeah, or 45 degree, then it can scramble your polarization uh, very much. But yeah, we, we tried to eliminate this effect with this uh, calibration. Yeah. So also the objective, right? So the, the objective is inside the cryostat or outside? Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, get objective, yeah. So the, the objective is inside the cryostat. Yeah, objective or outside. outside the cryostat. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, with this, it is uh, indeed some uncertainty in the measurement because uh, we cannot characterize uh, for for what happening inside the cryostat. So it has mirrors, and uh, yeah, it has uh, the objective also, which uh, which could also affect the polarization state. Yeah. So from this. We cannot uh, characterize it because the light will go twice with this, and the effect will probably cancel itself uh, when it reflects on the sample goes back. So yeah. 
but we try to do our best to characterize all that we can. Okay. So I have just a couple of questions now more on the physical aspect of, of the thesis. And um, uh, the first one is about, well, basically all are about the, the last part of your talk. So when you have the formation of um, vortices in the rotating trap, uh, so these these vortices uh, do not seem to uh, to be fixed to some equilibrium uh, state as is is due to disorder to out of equilibrium condition. Uh, how do you explain that? Yeah. So so basically, this vortex it is uh, not the same vortex as was observed. In 2008, which was pinned uh, on the defect, uh, yeah. So this vortex is uh, kind of a mode of of the optical trap. So on the excited state, the trap can host uh, either dipole state or the vortex state, which is the Laguerre Gaussian. So in the Laguerre Gaussian, you can see the you can so Laguerre Gaussian is a solution of the Schrodinger equation for the harmonic potential. And so uh, this vortex it is uh, fixed uh, by this geometry because uh, as I showed. It formed in the first excited state of the optical trap, which can have one minimum, so which has one minimum. And in this case, uh, it is the vortex state. So in this regard, it is pinned uh, to the geometry, to the confinement geometry. So yeah, it is that kind of vortex. So you don't expect to have lattices of vortices forming there, uh, even for larger trap? Yeah. So. Uh, this is a good question to, uh, so actually we saw the lattices of vortices in our work uh, so of the Kirill Sitnik in, in PRL, uh, he showed that it, is, it can be the lattice of four vortices formed inside this optical trap and the charge of the vortices they flip in time because now uh, in the optical trap, uh, the condensate occupies two energy levels which are close together at the spacing of five gigahertz approximately and this results to effective interference or beating signal which has vortices inside of it. So in this manner, uh, you can uh, uh, you can see a bigger number of vortices in the optical trap, but it will be still confined uh, by the fact of the optical trap. And uh, you probably will see can see something uh, which is reminiscent of the lattice, uh, like triangle lattice uh, of the vortices which is shown for the superfluid. Uh, but uh, it just will be a mode of the optical trap. In order to eliminate, uh, uh, can I actually show one slide? Yeah, just uh, in order, uh, some last one, uh, I don't know. No, no, uh, 58. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I just will continue uh, while uh, I will show you a slide. And uh, so in order to eliminate the effect of optical trapping, uh, we need to go to expanded condensate or make a trap even bigger uh, uh, to make the separation distance between the energy levels and the trap to be small. Maybe in this case, we can uh, see a bigger number of vortices. But what we have achieved so far, so it's actually uh, our recent archive uh, where we show uh, two vortices and uh, three vortices here. So, and you can see that uh, they are corrotated with optical trap, uh, but they do not form a lattice uh, or just uh, maybe lattice cell, triangle one. So here they aligned on one line uh, for the case of three vortices. And uh, it is dictated by the asymmetry of the optical trap. And I also saw four uh, vortices and they also didn't form the lattice. So basically the limiting factor here is again, the confinement. So, but in this case, if they are rotating, so how can you measure it in time integrated measurements? Uh, yeah, so uh, because it is a stable uh, pattern forming in the condensate. So it is a solution like a steady state uh, where we can uh, retrieve the phase. So we just measure average signal from the excitation shot and uh, of two microseconds, we interfere with, uh, with the lasers, uh, external laser with itself, and we can retrieve uh, the phase. So 
yeah, basically it is a steady state of the condensate, uh, which is just in the presence of rotation. Okay. Um, so I have another doubt uh, about the polarization in this kind of experiment. So here I suppose that is linearly polarized the pump and uh, no, the, no polarization analysis in the detection is correct. Uh, for this experiment, actually, the polarization was circular uh, in order not to deal with this polarization pinning and splitting of linear polarization state. So we just pump with circular polarization and the condensate is also circular because of the optical orientation. Yeah, and uh, so it is actually interesting to study the polarization of uh, such rotating traps because uh, I guess recently it was shown that it could be some polarization pattern forming in this uh, vertical state. But from what I can tell for now is that uh, I didn't see any polarization pattern forming. So I just look at it uh, briefly and I would say that condensate is uh, circularly polarized uh, as well as the pump, but maybe it is some complex dynamics happening in time. So it is, it is worth investigating, yeah. So do, do you think that uh, all vortices can be relevant to this discussion? Uh, sorry, which vortices? Uh, half vortices. Uh, half vortices. Uh, yeah, so yeah. maybe it, uh, it can appear before. Yeah, it could be. Uh, yeah, I didn't observe half vortices as well. So they, I do not saw the splitting and polarization domain. So I also had a vortex with charge one, not half and in one polarization, but yeah, it could be that maybe if you make uh, the rotation somehow, uh, the rotation frequency to be equal of the splitting uh, uh, from the sigma minus sigma plus components, which basically we did uh, for the uh, driven precession, maybe in this case, somehow you can uh, drive uh, both states to vortex states and it will be half quantized vortices, but yeah, so. Okay, uh, I have really last one. So can you give a physical explanation about the reason why um, higher frequencies bring the condensates to the ground state at lower power with respect to uh, lower frequencies? So what is the physical explanation for that? Yeah, it's a good question. So. Don't go to the slide. Uh, so uh, the explanation is as follows. At least what uh, we came up is that, uh, the, so you asking about this uh, slide, uh, why the condensate goes to the lower energy state for the bigger pump power. So uh, we, so our uh, approach to this is as follows. So when we pump more, uh, then due to the exciton diffusion, uh, uh, in the external reservoir, they come towards uh, the center of the pump spot, and effectively they increase the rotation potential, uh, the confining potential in the middle of the trap, which makes it shallow, it narrower, and that is why it cannot support now the excited state, and it is uh, pushed out of the trap. And that is why, as a bigger power, we see the transition from the excited state to the ground state. So it is uh, our explanation uh, for this. Yeah. I hope it. You, you, uh, you so, so you mean you mean that for higher frequencies, the blue shift is higher at the same pumping power, uh, or not? Maybe I didn't get it. No, no, no. I, uh, so it, it, it doesn't uh, actually concern the rotation frequency at all, because the same dynamics it happens just for the static trap. So when we just use uh, ring excitation and optical trap and scan the pump power, we will see the similar effect. Uh, which is shown here, the condensate also will form some energy state, but then eventually at some pumping power, it will go to the uh, lower state or to the ground state. So, and uh, what I was telling is that it is uh, the diffusion of the excitons, uh, which effectively shrinks the optical trap, make it small because it goes to the center of the optical trap. And that is why we lost uh, the first excited state and the condensate goes to the ground state. Uh, because uh, here the, the energy level which system chooses 
it is not, it shouldn't be lower state, just the state of uh, in the balance on the pump and, dissipa and dissipation in the system. And that is why uh, we think for this reason, because uh, now uh, the ground state is more, uh, like the system tends to go to the ground state because it's more uh, attractive to it, let's say, because of the lower gain and dissipation, dissipation, that's why it goes to the ground state. So, yeah. That, that is my explanation. Okay, thank you. So, Dario, I, you're done with questions, right? Yes, yes, I'm done. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, Fabrice, I now turn to you. Uh, so, how satisfied are you with the changes uh, uh, that, or corrections that uh, Ivan uh, has made in response to your comments, questions in the thesis? First of all, I was very satisfied by the manuscript in the, in the first stage. And then as a, as a big principle of perturbation theory, it's well known that the corrections uh, always go in the opposite direction. So I'm very satisfied by the replies, by the answers. I think it's um, good feedback on something which was already excellent. But I would still say that uh, I would expect in a thesis that you have the, the room to be very personal and uh, say things on the results, make comments that can be recorded, things you cannot put in papers. Maybe because the editors or the referees will not let you uh, say what you want. So in, this, in the physics, I would expect a very personal, direct, explicit comments. So I'm not saying that they are not there, but if there is a room, just in case, I've been explained there are four options. If there is room for revision, I strongly invite the candidate to um, write the physics uh, as, as, as his baby, where he will show his true art on the topic, something that is not accessible in the papers, maybe. And possibly we have the chance to to get this uh, this personal feedback from the from the questions. Okay. And uh, what about um, uh, Evan's presentation? Uh, have you uh, have any questions uh, on that? Yes. So I have various questions. I'll try to keep them short. I'm very sorry, first of all, that I couldn't be there physically present because there would have been the possibility to enter into much more details. It's a fascinating topic, actually. I've been myself. Uh, involved in this research from the very uh, early start. I started my PhD looking at the dynamic of polarization in something which was very related. So it's a topic that is very close to my heart. But in the interest of time, I will go only for the big fundamental basic question where I expect the, uh, not yet doctor, the, so Mr. Gnusov, I expect um, ex ex answers that are as candid as possible, right? First thing is that, there is a very related work uh, on your rotating bucket experiment, which to me is the is, is the most beautiful part of your physics. I think it's an experiment that is uh, really putting a milestone in the field of polyton physics and condensate on all these things, superfluity, very beautiful experiment. Um, so I'll probably concentrate most of my comments on this part. Uh, there is a related work, I believe, from the group of Michael Fraser, where he did something a bit similar, apparently at around the same time, and uh, you do cite it in your text, but uh, in line with what I said previously, it's just a command that we would find in the paper. It's made there, there is a citation, so the authors will be happy and uh, you, you, you make uh, an observation on what they do. But I would like that you please share to us what you think is different beyond the, the, the mere detail that you are doing it with the trap and you do it directly with the wave function, but what you think is conceptually uh, different from what they did, from what you do, and uh, what kind of statements uh, are, are in agreement between the two works? And if, maybe not, but if there are some things that are not, uh, that are contradictory, what are they? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Yeah, I know this work. Uh, so what is different? Uh, I'll start first with different. And uh, first of all, the different is the excitation scheme. So they also use, uh, Two excitation lasers by they shape uh, one of them uh, in the form of Gaussian, and the other one is the form of a ring, uh, similar that we do, and that is why uh, they are not uh, very constrained. So they are not that constrained, I would say, in the terms of the confinement as we are, uh, because they indeed have some uh, more or less flat uh, excitations, which is then just overlap which is Gaussian uh, overlap is a uh, ring one. And they have the, this, they steer, as I'd say, on top of it in that sense. Uh, 
so yeah and also what is different just from the experimental point of view they measure a different thing uh, they measure uh, actually with very uh, good technique very interesting one uh, the orbital angular momentum uh, by uh, by putting the aperture at the k space uh, and uh, they from this they can indeed uh, retrieve uh, the angular momentum of the of the whole condensate and that is what different but what is similar and what actually was uh, so very like supporting for me that they observe uh, the same frequency range where they see the vortex appearing and it is indeed also was uh, the gigahertz range so it was as i remember around one as well as in our case they observe also vortex and it means that this frequency so this uh, rotation speed it is some like kind of fundamental uh, more or less, uh, for because they use different sample so for the polaritons at least for similar property it is confirmed with the uh, results as well and uh, yeah so and what uh, also we do not measure we do not measure the angle momentum of the condensate because we just measure the statistics kind of appearing the vortexes and they do measure it and they show the smooth transition of uh, the uh, angular momentum uh, from negative to positive frequency going from low so like from minus one to one and uh, they do not observe this abrupt uh, transition of the vortex formation so it is also was different but uh, so they indeed observe the transfer of the angular momentum from the trap rotating trap to the condensate and yeah it is was different and uh, yeah also um, so i would say uh, that they also propose uh, the uh, so from the simulation they saw some kind of uh, vortex lattice forming so they, ha they have around eight vortices uh, in the optical trap but for the simulation and maybe they were able to uh, re to realize it in the experiment because again uh, they pumping scheme even though it is similar to ours it has the difference of the using Gaussian beam and it can indeed allow to uh, to to observe the vortex lattice which can be the evidence of the of the superfluidity of the condensate in their case so yeah i would say uh, it is that's it yeah for concerning this question okay thank you um from, from the technical point of view who would you say uh, had the idea of using these two uh, beatings these two modes to have the rotation is it coming from the polyton communities and in which case is it from the fraser group or from the the lagudakis group or is it coming from still overs community and you adapted the idea to polytons uh so no uh, idea yeah i mean the idea in general the experiment uh, so at least uh, for me paulus proposed it but uh, the method uh, for the rotation so for the beating of two signals with different angle momentum this is known so i saw it at some papers concerning i guess atomic bc and it is at least one paper from uh kartashov uh, where he theoretically studied it it cost uh, it called uh, by chromatic uh, beam something so uh, they also theoretically study the uh the trap or uh, not uh, yeah, the beam which was composed of two uh, lasers and which rotated in time but theoretically and then observe some uh, patterns forming the condensate so in this sense uh, the idea of the rotation using two beam it is not novel uh, but maybe the application for the uh, polaritons it is novel so yeah when is it from the the cold atomic gaze when, what is the date what is it uh, for the, the paper? Time. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, sorry, what you mean the papers uh, of the Kartashov? The cold atom, this idea from the cold atom, from this Kartashov group it comes from which uh, time? Yeah, so the Kartashov, it, it, it is for polariton. So I guess it is some uh, 2018 or something. It is, uh, it is cited in, in, in the thesis and in, the, in my paper in Science Advances. And I also saw it uh, somewhere but I don't remember the date. Probably it was. Kartashov, hang on, hang on. Yeah, I'm, I'm confusing you. Kartashov is the uh, polytonic theorist, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the the cold atom implementation of this idea of laser. What? When does it date from? Yeah. So I uh, I cannot tell exactly. It's just uh, roughly just when I become across the, I... the 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 rotating uh, the, the rotating bucket experiment with superfluid is from 
when 2000 right? no 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 uh, no uh, there was different technique uh, for the bc for the atomic condensate they rotate it uh, just by deflecting the laser so they do not use uh, this uh, interfering or beating beams so maybe uh, yeah maybe i'm wrong it's not for bc maybe for some other but as i remember i saw some work where they discuss the interference of two lasers so not probably just yeah from theoretical point of view but yeah it cannot tell for sure but right. yeah and even though yeah we, 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 we are not uh, based on on these papers even of kartashov papers so i just came up across it uh, when we already were implementing this experiment so yeah Okay, Kartashov, good. I mean, if you is one thing and you can propose and have great ideas, it's one thing, but the experimental implementation is something else. So uh, is it uh, documented in your thesis, the, the origin of this technique? Would you say that this is the case and I just missed it or should it be maybe? Yeah, yeah. I, I, at least I every way I cite the Kartashov. Again, I'm not asking about Kartashov, which is theoretical proposal, right? Which again is fine, but you can propose lots of things. And yeah, yeah. To, I mean, I, to no, want I, to do I, something and to actually do it is a different thing. So I'm asking about the pioneer, the first people who use these uh, beatings of two modes to uh, bring some mechanical rotation in some optical or condensed matter system. Who, who would you say this is, and when does it date from? That's I, my question. I so I don't remember. I think no. So. I mean, because we, do, we we are not based on some paper. That is the thing. So I, I when I did the experiment, uh, when I created the rotating beam, I do not, I wasn't uh, like referring to any other paper. That is why I do not know of any just from the uh, tip of my uh, head. Right, and that's fair enough. Of course, to implement it, you don't need, you just need the idea and you do it. And that's science, and that's the most important thing. I'm asking yeah. just maybe in case you know when there is uh, the time to look at the big achievement of people and who had the first idea it's interesting to, to yeah uh, to, i checked uh, it, yeah but I, I i i will check what what is it that paper that i came across yeah okay okay thank you and then let let me know if you if, if in case it's not properly documented in the physics in which case i'll just read it again and look for myself Another question, which is again a big fundamental question, not going into the technicality of what you did, but you know, in this polyton community, there is an endless debate on what is actually the nature of the of the phase that is being studied. If it's a condensate or quasi condensate or a current state or pseudo current state or whatever, and uh, or the same with superfluidity. So there is a lot of debates that maybe are sterile and not very important, and you might say that you you don't care. But let's see if we can learn something from your system. Because again, this rotating bucket experiment, I always thought since the beginning, I think I mentioned it as early as 2003 in the very first paper that mentioned superfluidity for polytons. I believe we are saying that ideally you should you should mechanically rotate the sample until the vortex lattice appear, and that would be the, the proof that it's a, a genuine uh, superfluid. Now, um, I would like to know if if this is what you think that the observation, the new experiment or expansion of your experiment, because this is Still the beginning, right? You have one vortex and you don't see lattices yet. But I would like to to know uh, if you think that this could settle this question and and, and qualify that what we have there is a, a real super free in the sense that it's not something we could get with some non-interacting optical uh, field, which also can accommodate vortices and they can do lattices and they can do lots of things. But we wouldn't say that light is super free, right? While a uh, matter field, and maybe the polyton is more like a matter field because it's got this interacting exciton, could be super field. So I would like that you tell us if your experiments or variations of them, they could bring a um, compelling answer to this question or, or yeah. not, and still. Thank you for the question. It is a good question, actually. And uh, so it actually was the idea initially to prove uh, the if the condensate is superfluid with this rotating bucket experiment uh, that we implement. But from what I can say now that uh, this paper, this, uh, this study uh, uh, and uh, the study of the Fraser group, it, it cannot be uh, the 100% proof of the superfluidity uh, because indeed uh, we do not observe and they do not observe uh, the increasing number of vortices uh, with the increasing rotating speed. And uh, in this regard, uh, 
uh, we uh, cannot say definitely if uh, the condensate in this state is superfluid. And uh, yeah, and we do not actually claim it uh, in the paper and uh, in this uh, talk, I wanted to claim it uh, because it, it could not be the evidence. But for the uh, question, if it can be shown on this system, I think, yeah, it can be shown indeed because uh, this uh, technique for the rotation is now realized. And now it's just uh, the matter of, uh, of, of choosing the proper excitation potential. Uh, so the proper basically laser beams uh, in order to realize it. Uh, because in this experiment, as I was telling you, the condensate is trapped in the, uh, in the excited state of the optical trap. And, and this was uh, limiting our measurement only in this state. And that's why we, uh, we do not observe the increasing number of vortices. But in general, uh, if you do, so I can came up with some uh, ideas at least, uh, we can study the extended condensate, the condensate, uh, which is big. So we create a very big trap. Uh, and there you can put some small steerer, make the same technique and start to steer it in there. So in this sense, for the extended condensate, uh, you will not be uh, limited by the confinement of the optical trap. And in this case, you probably will see the big the number of vortices forming in the condensate. So and it would be the, I would say, solid proof of the polarity and superfluidity. But for now, we cannot say that it is. So, yeah. Right, right. And, and so the limitation is, was it just technical? What is prevent you from using the larger condensate? Yeah, so for now it is technical because, uh, so like we can do the bigger traps, we can do like 30 micron trap, but uh, from at least what I tried, uh, the, the condensate uh, always condense in some state of the optical trap and we do not see the continuum of state, something like this. And uh, in the experiment, we could not uh, create very big condensate uh, first because of we will not have enough power to make a very big condensate of the lasers. And second of all, that we cannot uh, create a big enough excitation laser uh, due to the aberrations uh, from the mirrors of the cryostat. So for now it is technical, but probably some way around uh, could be found. And yeah, it is for the further work, for the further investigation. I see. So the, the suspense is still uh, holding, at least for some time. Um, another question, this one is very quick, maybe. Um, so you speak of control. Yeah, your physics is really oriented around control of the polarization, the spin, all these things. Uh, still, you're using current pumping throughout. So to, to uh, control things, you also have the option to use resonant current driving. So why is it something that you exclude altogether? Yeah, so indeed, uh, actually, the easiest way to control uh, the spin, as you said, uh, it is the resonant injection of polariton. So you will inject uh, the resonant uh, beam with some polarization. It will transfer to the, uh, to the condensate, and that's it. But uh, so the idea of this uh, thesis was to investigate uh, the non-resonant uh, excitation, because, as I said, uh, it is uh, very prominent uh, for the application because it uh, considerably increases uh, the coherence time of the condensate and spin coherence time of the condensate. So in this regard, uh, the resonant excitation, excitation with optical trap, it would be probably beneficial for the future applications because first we'll have coherent condensate, which you can work with. And uh, second of all, uh, you do not need to tune uh, the parameters of your pump laser very finely. So you just, uh, as you would do for the resonant trap, for the resonant excitation. Uh, you just, from the resonant one, you just uh, basically use these effects. You can use these effects uh, for different pump polarization. You just set polarization, you will have uh, defined polarization of the, of the condensate, or you shape your, shape your trap in different, in a definitive manner, and you will have the polarization in the condensate. In this regard, uh, the control is much less. Uh, I mean, not control, but uh, the, the tuning of the excitation laser is much less. And yeah, that is why the non-resonant excitation is probably more convenient for the future, for the future applications. And that is why uh, we are studying it. Okay, okay, that's clear. And the really last question. So you speak of the condensate. At some point, I think we even explicitly define it as, the, as something which is described by one microscopic wave function. 
but particularly under incoherent excitation, we can understand that you don't have a pure condensate. Yeah, you got some fraction which is incoherent or thermal or whatever. Yeah, you don't have condensed completely. It can be more or less uh, beyond threshold. So um, is, this is not something that uh, that I believe has been discussed very much. So if, if this is the case, why not? Don't you think it would be interesting to quantify the, the, the degree of condensation, for instance, through, through the observation polarizations or things like this? Yeah. Uh, so indeed, uh, as it, so it is a big uh, discussion, like what is the, what is the polarity in condensate? So someone think it is not a condensate, it is laser. Someone think it is a condensate. Some say it is Bose condensate. Some it is Bose and stain condensate. So there is a lot of uh, questions about it. But in any case, it is indeed uh, an equilibrium system in our case. And actually, you can do as I know the equilibrium condensate, which will be polarity in condensate, which will be in equilibrium with the with the sample or with the like uh, the surrounding of the sample of the condensate. But in this case, uh, as for the uh, kind of uh, for the per percentage of the condensate that we have, I wouldn't uh, discuss it in these terms uh, from the because uh, we have the most of the emission coming from the condensate and just a little part of it coming from the incoherent reservoir, which is not condensed, uh, which is visible, for example, on the any dispersion images that I was uh, showing you. But as a, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the like the signature of the condensation could be so the measurable one could be first the coherence of the condensate and second it is the polarization of the condensate. So basically, by measuring the degree of polarization here, you can tell how good is your condensate. Uh, but uh, so, for example, here actually on this slide, uh, you can see that DOP here is close to one for the case of uh, circularly polarized excitation, and you can say that. Uh, like more, uh, a lot of the polaritons are indeed condensed and have one uh, spin state. However, you can see that increasing the power, the degree of polarization, it lowers, and we have uh, some zero degree of polarization region. But again, as I was telling you, uh, telling previously that uh, this measurement, they are integrated one, so they integrate not only within one shot, but over a lot of excitation shots. So. Uh, within this shot, the condensate polarization could fluctuate and it can fluctuate within the excitation pulse. And that is why we have effective lowering of the degree of polarization. So yeah, so that I guess what I can say about the other parameter like and the goodness of condensate in this method. So the, the linear polarization is, is the other parameter for condensation? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, just just any polarization, circle one. So if the condensate is, uh, so if the polarities are condensed, they should have uh, one value of the spin, and it is you can measure it, and it it could be a good uh, hallmark. Like, uh, in the same uh, range of the polarity and superfluidity. Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess I got most of what you said. It cut a little bit in places, but I think I get it. So again, we, this is something that we studied a lot, both theoretically uh, with Alexei Kawokin, uh, experimentally, even with Dario who is there, we studied the link between the polarization and the, the condensation measured by the line width narrowing sort of things. And uh, I, I believe it's something that would be interesting to see discussed more detail, not only your work, but are your work criticized, complete, or confirms previous works? You even you even infirming the previous work, which obviously becoming earlier and more naive would be very fine. So I would say that you tend to put a reference and the slightest possible comment, and it's more interesting to see, um, to commit yourself more to, to what you want to say. So I think that's all. Uh, I also want to associate myself to, to Dario's uh, congratulations to both yourself and your team, because this is really very nice work, not only technically, but for the physics that is involved. And uh, again, uh, this rotating bucket experiment, I think you've been lucky that you've been offered to implement it, because 
I truly believe that we'll stay at the milestone of the very, very beautiful experiment done in Polytonics. Maybe you didn't get to the end of it. I don't know if yourself or people who follow after you will uh, will find the holy grail of, of vortices uh, forming spontaneously in the superfluid of Polyton. But at least you put the first uh, brick. And for that, well, all my congratulations. Thank you, Fabrice. Um, now I would like to um, ask Nina Voronova if she is happy with the uh, corrections and um, revisions that Ivan made to his uh, thesis in response to her comments, and also if she has any questions on uh, Ivan's presentation today. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm totally happy uh, with the changes of the thesis. I think I was the worst referee. I mean, I asked so many questions in, the, in my report, but it's actually praising your work. It's not because I didn't like it. I just like this beautiful work, all results. Um, and in fact, uh, I have a couple of questions remaining, uh, maybe because your answers confuse me even more. So if you could go back to slide 19. It doesn't work. So I, I will start saying the questions. So it is about this additional TTM splitting, which is produced by the ellipticity of the of the trap. This um, splitting, which you plot in this figure, is for which momentum? It's integrated over momentum over whole. So, uh, so it is not for k equal to zero because in the thesis actually it's written literally that this is a splitting at a k equal to zero. I mean, yeah, because the quantum state is at k equal to zero, so it is for the k equal to zero. Yeah, yeah, but then if we look at the formula, we see that it should be proportional to the TTM splitting, and we know that TTM splitting at k equal to zero is zero. Yeah, yeah, zero, zero so uh, in the yeah. end, I got confused with your answer. I can explain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, so indeed, uh, the TTM splitting is uh, zero for k equal to zero because it grows for the bigger k as a function of k. But uh, what we can see here is that uh, even though the condensate, uh, so it is the k space, kx, ky, and we have the condensate here uh, in the middle, so it is the k equal to zero, but it is uh, it has some finite values of k indeed. So it's not like exactly at zero. So it is distributed along uh, the k space here. And that is why, uh, the TTM splitting indeed affects it uh, because it has some finite distribution along uh, the k space. So this. So it's kind of integrated TTM splitting. Yes, yes, because uh, you see that uh, if you plot uh, the TTM splitting in the k space, you will see that uh, the uh, arrows which uh, which point uh, the direction of the field will go like around the circle in different uh, directions, and that is why. Uh, because for each orientation of the optical trap, we have unique distribution of the k vectors. So this distribution results in some effective one, which uh, which results into this splitting, uh, yeah, which we observe. So it is, like, but okay. yeah, in general, you, it cannot be explained just with the uh, uh, splitting of the energy levels in the optical trap, uh, in the elliptical one. So even when you see elliptical, when you have elliptical potential, you will have the splitting. Yeah, so, sure. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question, uh, also following my question in, in the report. I mean, you answered it, but actually I didn't, I mean, meant something different with my question. So if we go to the rotating bucket experiment and you measure the healing length of the vortex, and then you go to a different trap and you get a vortex there and you measure a healing length of the vortex, could you extract by measuring different healing lengths in different uh, traps in different experiments? actually retrieve the interaction constant, which is a debate because no one really knows the interaction constant of polarity is a big debate, right? There have been plenty of papers. So my question was, like you answered my question in the report by simply calculating the, the, the interaction constant, but I asked, could you use this method to actually uh, retrieve the real interaction by uh, making several experiments, measuring several healing lengths and getting the real G of polarity? This was the question. Yeah. Uh... So, I mean, in, in the answer I did, uh, kind of uh, retrieved the interaction value, but to, to what uh, degree we can uh, say that it is true value, I, I, I mean, I mean it, it is the actual value of the interaction in the sample of polytons, 
I do not say, but from the formulas, uh, it, it should be that the healing lens is proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the interaction constant. And that's why by measuring it for different dead units uh, or for different trap sizes, you indeed can plot some dependence where you will retrieve uh, the uh, interaction constants for different conditions. Yeah, But uh, uh, I didn't say it in the response, but uh, the healing lens, usually it is uh, calculated for the uh, medium uh, which, which is uh, like flat and has one vortex inside of it. And that's when the healing lens is calculated uh, as a profile of a, like of a half of this uh, intensity of the vortex. But in our case, uh, the uh, vortex is trapped uh, in the optical trap and it also affect uh, the so the way how you will extract the healing lens so from the estimation that i did and the response i just take uh, the radius like of the vortex uh, i mean uh, yeah and uh, but in the case of uh, optical trap at least for the uh, for the condensate you should take some uh, this sigma zero which is i, I didn't get uh, where it should be taken but it is some other value that's why it is uh, probably the interaction constant will be different if you take this sigma zero value. But in general, I guess it is a way how you can uh, retrieve uh, the interaction constant, but it will be more fair to do it for the uh, like continuous condensate, but not trap. Right, thank you. So yeah, I'm happy with the answers and the congratulations, beautiful results. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And um, I would like now to ask um, Yuri Gladush if he is happy with the changes and corrections made by Ivan, and also if he has any questions on his on Ivan's presentation, or maybe something outstanding on on Ivan's thesis. Uh, okay. So first of all, I am happy with the answers that Ivan provided uh, to my uh, comments. And I want to say that I really like uh, the dissertation. So I, what I really like about it, how it forms the story, right? So it is not just some random works somehow squeezed into one dissertation. You really follow with the author uh, step by step how he come from uh, spin uh, dynamics to this beautiful rotating bucket uh, experiment, which I also uh, liked very much. Uh, so uh, yes, I also have a couple of questions uh, related to your uh, remaining questions related to your talk. So uh, first of all, I think it is instrumental one. So if you look at uh, the pictures, at least those that you show in your uh, dissertations, it, it seems like uh, on your experimental data, the degree of polarization never reach one. So it's 0 0.8, sometimes 0 0.9, uh, for example, for uh, on the plots for elliptical trap. So is it really just some uh, instru instrumental problems that prevent you to get closer to nine, or there is some physics behind it. Yeah, yeah. so actually there are both of these factors. So the most, uh, most like uh, the biggest value of uh, degree of polarization was for the circle polarization of the excitation where is around one. So for these cases it is, so condensate is approximately 100% polarized, but uh, for the cases of linear polarization state here, where these uh, uh, reasons which I will list come in. So first of all, uh, we investigate the integrated polarization and it is integrated uh, for a lot of the shots, extension shots. That is why if polarization will flip or change somehow slightly due to the fluctuation of laser, for example, or due to some noise in the detector, if it will change, we will measure some average signal and it will be effectively lowered. And that is why we have a low degree of de polarization, lower degree of polarization that we would expect and uh, yeah also uh, from the physical point of view it could be that uh, some so it is actually that we show as that i showed that within the pulse uh, the condensate polarization uh, could be unstable so it, it it could have some instant flips for example for the case of linear polarization excitation that is why again uh, when you averages out uh, over different uh, over a lot of shots, you will see the effective lowering of the, of the polarization. And uh, yes, so I think uh, that that is more or less the reasons. And also, yeah, so they're both physical and in, 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 instrumental. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, I see. Uh, now talking about mechanisms. So if we look uh, related actually to what you're talking about, so if we look at the mechanism uh, that you presented uh, at slide number 10, uh, we see that for linear polarization, the result shouldn't be dependent on the wavelengths of your excitation. But for elliptical polarization, it should be dependent on the wavelengths of your excitation because if you excite high enough, uh, you will have thermalization of your spins, right? So did, did you did you actually check it? Or, or um, you always use just one excitation yeah, and that's it? One, which is actually quite uh, highly detuned from the low Clariton branch. So it's like, uh, uh, so 60 nanometers. So it's quite quite a lot, like red uh, So it's detuned, yeah, uh, from the from the uh, from the condensate and from the mm -hmm. low polarity branch. So it is quite far above. But we usually, uh, so we always pump with the same wavelengths. We didn't check the dependence on the wavelengths, and uh, we pumped in the first break minimum, uh, which appears on the after the stop band of the DBR mirrors of the our structure, and uh, it allowed. So yeah, basically with this, uh, we increase the efficiency and we didn't uh, because more light coming in and if we use the other one probably the threshold will uh, increase and etc mm -hmm. and we didn't that's why we didn't check if the optical orientation will disappear in this case but in general mm -hmm. it could because if it is enough time to all to the half of polar and spin to flip then it will be equal and then it goes to some other polarization state mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and uh, the last question is uh, related to slide number 14. Uh, yeah, yeah, previous, previous, please. Yeah, this picture. So, so according to what you're saying, right, so you have two regions of uh, zero polarization degree. So the one is for linear polarization, which caused by flipping. But the other one is caused by precession. So it seems like two very different mechanisms. But uh, uh, again, according to your data, it seems like you can adiabatically move from one to another. So I wonder so uh, how it happens. Uh, so is it some, should it be some threshold or? Uh, yeah. So I don't see how you can come adiabatically from one uh, uh, process to another. Yeah, I mean, uh, because so this data, first of all, it is uh, it consists of a lot of uh, points. So each of them measured for uh, for the integrated like condensate emission. So I would say we couldn't uh, continuously drive the system from the linear polarization to elliptical within one extension pulse because you, in this case you will should you should rotate the photo wave plate quite fastly in order to to be in the microsecond window and on the, to feed the dynamics of the coins which is also very fast. But in general, yes, yeah, so uh, the alarm of precession here, you can see that if you average this out, at least for this case, you will see some reminiscent value of uh, some small value of uh, S1 component, which will be around 0 0.5 as the average measurement. So it will not be uh, zero exactly. And uh, what is this region is about is that in between uh, in between the polarization pinning and uh, the precession, which is happening here for the typical polarization, we see that we, it's probably what's happening that the condensate cannot choose what to do, kind of, and uh, he either flip or uh, precess, and from shot to shot, it averages out to zero degree of polarization. So it is this border region, it is kind of where this uh, affects the, uh, so the like present, uh, all together for different shots, and that is why we have the degree of polarization close to zero. So it is the result of averaging over yeah. many realizations. Okay. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, so uh, now it's my turn. Um, I can say that uh, I'm also uh, satisfied, or perhaps even very satisfied, with the changes that uh, Ivan made uh, to his thesis in response to my. Uh, comments and questions. Um, now, uh, I think I have uh, perhaps two or three uh, uh, sort of outstanding questions, uh, some of which are related to uh, Ivan's presentation and uh, to his dissertation. So, um, first of all, um, I, I, 
I noticed, Ivan, that you, uh, you, you decided to, kept, uh, to keep uh, the description of, uh, detailed description of the principle of operation of special light modulator based on Vigor Crystal. Uh, so in my view, it's a fairly standard device, uh, uh, the operation of which is kind of well documented elsewhere. So I just wonder why you, why, why you have decided to kind of to keep it uh, in your dissertation. I mean, uh, is, uh, is the principle of its operation uh, key to some of the, uh, you know, to physics or um, sort of design of, of your experiments? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, actually, uh, I, uh, yeah, I decided to leave it, and I I see a question about it uh, in the review. But uh, so, like generally speaking, the SLM is uh, is the main device in the experimental setup. So except for the sample, which is not a device, and uh, because we shape uh, the excitation beam with it in a different uh, patterns that we use, and I thought that it is important to describe how it works and I just uh, leave it in the thesis. But concerning the difference, as you asked uh, in the thesis, between the like uh, mirrors, uh, MEMS mirrors, which also reflect or uh, can make the shape that we want, or the uh, transmission SLM that are also possible uh, alternative for this. Uh, I think I, uh, so basically the reflective one, it is better in the sense because uh, from, from the, uh, what was available on the market, as I saw, for example, a Torlop that was just a 19 by 19 uh, MEMS mirrors like system. So it will not be enough resolution for our case. And that's why uh, I think, uh, so we choose SLM. And for the transmission one, uh, just because we put usually a lot of power here and probably the transmission one has a lower damage threshold than it is the reflective one. That's why we use uh, the reflective one. But yeah, so that's why I left the description in the thesis. Okay. Um, uh, the second question. Um, now, uh, uh, you used two special light modulators uh, for creating two elliptical condensate. Uh, could you not use just one SLM for creating and controlling uh, sort of simultaneously two condensate? Say one beam, two identical uh, condensates. Uh, should it um, uh, should it be easier to ensure the same power uh, in each of the condensates? Yeah. So actually, I mean, in principle, it is possible. So we can create uh, two elliptical traps with one SLM. So it's not a problem. So we have a code for it. But uh, what is it? The problem that uh, in this case you cannot make them ideally equal uh, because just from the from the experimental point of view, so it's just what happens when you uh, do some couple traps uh, on the one SLM, you will see that they're a bit different and that is very, was very crucial for the experiment for the couple traps because uh, we need to control the shape separately and the power separately, which is, which is of course possible to do with one SLM, but with the two SLM, it just was easier and more straightforward to do it because with, with two SLM, we can control separately the orientation of the traps, the pump power that we use for each of the trap. And yeah, that is why uh, we use two. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. Um, and uh, last question, uh, it will be related to a rotating bu bucket experiment. So uh, as far as I uh, remember, uh, you used uh, two lasers uh, of different intensity in the steering experiment but you uh, used two lasers uh, of the same intensity in the rotating bucket experiment. Mm -hmm. So why was it important for, for the rotating bucket experiment? Why could, not, uh, why could you not use different intensities as in the steering uh, experiment? Yeah, uh, so in general, you can use uh, not equal intensity for the rotating bucket and equal intensities for this experiment, but uh, why I use here, the nautical intensity that is first of all because uh, with nautical intensity so when the intensity of one laser is 10 percent of that of the other we see that we have the similar optical trap uh, shape which uh, which is good to starting point to do the experiment because we have already studied this type of optical trap and also in this experiment we studied very slow rotation which is uh, five megahertz or even less so in this regard if you make uh, the intensity of two laser lasers equal uh, then uh, eventually you will not confine the condensate in the horizontal direction and it will not form a good elliptical shape. 
that we'll need to the experiment. That is why we had uh, to rise, uh, so they make an equal ratio, yeah, different uh, different intensity of two lasers to to make uh, the potential wall in this direct in this direction higher to confine the condensate and to make it elliptical, but not some stripe prolonged or something like this. So it was the reason behind this. But why did we use uh, the equal intensity for the rotating bucket uh, for this? Uh, we wanted to investigate for the fast frequency uh, rotation. And uh, when you go to the fast frequency, as I was showing you previously, then this smearing of the reservoir is kicks in. That is why if you are, if the intensity of two lasers will be like this, for example, that is, it, it will smear out for the lower rotation frequency because there is already some intensity, like uh, some uh, uniform intensity on this rotating pattern. And it will smear out slow, uh, faster for the lower frequency. That's why we use equal intensity. But in general, you can increase this trap, uh, make, make it bigger, and it will result, result in a vortex in the rotating bite experiments. So, but for the, just for the slow frequency. So there is no limitation on, on this. So you'll see a vortex. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ivan. Um, so uh, I think now I'm going to take questions from the audience, uh, say starting from, from those who are present in the room. So ask away now or remain silent forever. Please. Hello, my name is Stepan. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it is and was great pleasure to work with Ivan. I worked with him for uh, more than four years. He is a very uh, passionate uh, investigator and experimentalist. And my question is related to the uh, to the data you shown when uh, you uh, aligned the rotation of the condensate with the self-induced larmor precessions and showed a, a resonant feature of uh, spinor coherence time extension. I want to ask, um, I understand that your temporal res resolution of your HBT setup limits you to absorb a higher uh, frequencies of uh, rotation and uh, uh, rotation of the condensate. However, do you think it would be um, to, to, to to, to which extent uh, the condensate will uh, continue to uh, rotate? Is it like 10 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz? And is it maybe uh, somewhat related to the feature that you shown on uh, the rotating bucket experiment with there is some limitation when the frequencies drops down? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, so as for the so, the, uh, so for the limitation and uh, of the experimental setup and what we already saw is that we can measure approximately to four gigahertz of rotation and we were able to observe it. So here it is already two gigahertz rotation. So at least it will rotate up to four. That's what I can say for sure. But uh, from the from the theoretical like point of view, uh, eventually probably at the same uh, frequency, as it was for the rotating bucket experiment, uh, this uh, smearing of the reservoir will, will kick in again, and uh, we will not be able to exert the rotation to the to the condensate and uh, rotated spin as well. So I would say that uh, just uh, from the rotating bucket experiment, we saw that vortices uh, disappear around four. So when we make a trap bigger, the vortices was disappearing around six gigahertz. Uh, for this experiment, the trap is smaller, so I would say that probably maybe three gigahertz or around it, it will be the limiting, uh, like the fastest rotating, rotation frequency in this uh, experiment. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, other questions? Yes. Please. Hello, my name is Anton. Uh, Ivan, thank you for your great presentation. I have one question regarding this spinal driven precession, I guess. So can you go to the slide number, whatever it is, uh, on spinal driven precession? No, no, not this one where you show the long, um, so on nanos hundreds of nanoseconds, yes. So if we take a look at the particular scans separated by, I think, uh, 20 nanoseconds in time, so the slope of the decay of each of the scan is much steeper than the 
overall fitting fun fitting blue uh, guide to the uh, guide to the eye line, I guess. Yes. So is it some kind of a technical feature or because to me it looks a bit that so it's not the miscalculation of the time delay axis, yes? No, time delay just manually added with uh, fibers. With the fibers. So, and why is then, uh, uh, yeah, the, the slope of each scan is steeper than the overall decay, which you attribute to this? Uh... Yeah, that's a good question. Thank so you. Uh, it is the, the artifact of the measurement system actually. So indeed, when we make uh, the delay negative, we always see this uh, increase uh, towards uh, the bigger time delay. That is why it grows for this. Graphs, but it just comes from the experiment due to some nonlinearity in the measure or like tact linearity in the measurement apparatus. So we also saw it. But I have another set of data, I guess, I don't know, maybe here. I will show. Um, basically, when we uh, make delay not negative but positive, so for some reason it helped uh, to avoid. Uh, this nonlinearity and so here it is actually the graph for the lasers of the correlation function but in general the same you can see that it is flat uh, for the whole measurement window 15 microseconds but uh, yeah so it is just from the measurement it's not the signature uh, not the characteristic of polarity and also uh, we try to increase uh, the measurement window but uh, just uh, in the uh, like in the software, so because it allows to, to measure in a bigger time delay uh, without adding additional delay. And we also see there the decay of the uh, G2 function. So it was confirmed with other experiment. And yeah, that is why we think that those increase, it was just the uh, measurement artifact. Mm. Uh, thank you. So here you uh, sort of post-processingly apply this uh, correction function to no, the, no, no, no. no. Here, here, so you can see there it was negative delay. So we just uh, added uh, the uh, the delay to one of the arms of the interferometer. And here we added them to another one. And we see that in this, when we do this, uh, we do not see this effect. So maybe it has to do somehow with some unequal intensity, which we measure in the different arms. But uh, in general, our understanding is that it's just coming from the SPC card and to just give us for the negative delay this increase. So, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions um, in this room? If not, then I wonder, Eleni, if uh, if there are any questions from the members of the audience who joined us online. I can't say any. Are there any in the, in the chat? Mm, no, no, it was only my call for questions, but I've got no response and I can't see any raised hands. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so then I guess um, I can conclude uh, um, this question part. And uh, I think once again, um, jury members and the member of the audience for their questions. And I would also like to uh, salute Ivan for his robust answers. And before uh, the jury move on to close deliberation and voting, I would like to give an opportunity for uh, Ivan's uh, supervisors uh, to say a few words about you know, the experience of supervising uh, and working with uh, Ivan. Um, so, um, uh, Pavlos? Hello, yeah, okay. So what can I say about Ivan? Uh, uh, Ivan started actually, he joined our lab when he started his uh, master's many, many years ago, coming from a very strong group uh, in Moscow. And uh, at the time, I was very impressed by his uh, solid background of physics. Uh, almost any problem I would throw at him, uh, he would very efficiently and methodically come with a solution. And uh, during his master's, he managed rapidly to develop to uh, a very dexterous experimentalist as well. Uh, the experiments that he performed during his master's were experiments that uh, I had been trying uh, in my labs to do for quite some time, but not successfully. And uh, 
really he managed to pin down the dynamics of the spin or properties of polarity and condensates in its different uh, uh, ramifications. Uh, by the end of his master's, I have to say that uh, Ivan was already uh, mm, he, he, he was already uh, a fully fledged uh, independent researcher. He really had very good knowledge of the field and he was an expert experimentalist. So really when Ivan started his PhD, he was at a different level. Uh, and that's why uh, during his PhD, he really managed to do uh, some of the most complex experiments that uh, I had ever uh, uh, thought possible and designed, uh, especially this rotating bucket experiment. Uh, I don't think that uh, many people actually, or even myself, could repeat in the lab. <laughs> it requires tremendous complexity, uh, but also beyond that, what uh, has impressed me with uh, uh, Ivan is that every time uh, I was proposing something. Uh, really, uh, his response was very thoughtful, and he 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 has the background to debate. And through this debate, actually, the end result uh, in many cases was very different to what I had in mind initially. And it was the product, really, of Ivan's thorough research in the subject and uh, wonderful experimental. Uh, abilities. So it has been a huge pleasure to work with Ivan, who really brought uh, a lot to the lab and he really managed to excel. Thank you, Ivan. Sergey, uh, would you like? I would like just to confirm all words said by Paulus, and uh, it was really uh, a pleasure to work with Ivan. He was uh, self motivated. Uh, he read a lot of literature and actually uh, the strongest um, feature of Ivan is um, systematic approach which he develops to, to extreme details. And actually he is capable of analyzing the data, doing experimental uh, work and uh, so he's a universal scientist I would say. And in this sense I think uh, he will be uh, very active in the field, and uh, I would like to celebrate Ivan and say um, uh, that, uh, words of congratulations with these results, which, uh, as Palas mentioned, we considered as something uh, visible in the future, but not so close future. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy, more than happy, with uh, such colleague as Ivan, and I, I'm happy for, for him to defend his thesis today. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. So uh, now it's time for discussion among the jury members and the voting. And so I would like to ask uh, uh, everyone who is not jury member to leave this room. Okay, so I would like to voice the outcome of uh, the voting, um, and it's my great pleasure to announce that it has been unanimously decided to uh, accept uh, Ivan's thesis as is and award him the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Well done, Ivan. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all of all of you uh, who are here. So, uh, yeah, it was a big journey, actually, uh, from the master's uh, to the PhD, like six years. And now I'm here, so I'd like <clears throat> to thank, first of all, Paulus uh, for being a beautiful supervisor, for letting me work in the hypersonics lab to do the, such beautiful experiments for his advice uh, during the PhD and the yeah, all of he done for me. And uh, so second of all, I'd like to thank you, Sergey, uh, who is also uh, very much helped me during my PhD study. So he helped me in experiments, he guided me in experiments and uh, helped to write papers. Also, I'd like to thank you, uh, to send Helgi, who is not here, uh, but he uh, actually did a lot of help uh, from the theoretical part of my research. 
and it uh, actually these studies which I presented they were not be possible without Helgi. So yeah, it's true. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Stepan and Kirill and uh, Anton and other guys from the uh, from the lab uh, for for their help also and friendship and good atmosphere and advice and help the experiments. So, so everything. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, so I also would like to thank the jury members and the chair of the jury for for very thorough and for very detailed review of my uh, thesis for the very good comments, which I uh, uh, tried to answer, I hope. And uh, thank you for participation here, for your time and for your attention. So thank you very much for that. So and finally, and not finally, I would like to thank my friends who are there and my father. So thank you, friends, Ivan, Daulet, Oksana. Uh, and thank you for supporting me as well and for being here today. And finally, I would like to thank Skoltik. Actually, a great place to study in Russia, to do the research. So thank you very much.